the most popular t-shirts that we produce. God bless you. You say, uh, what does God bless you mean? Well, it's on the back. God, God makes you happy. God heals you. God prospers you. God gives you divine favor. God makes all your circumstances well. Hachu! Oh, thank you for, for blessing me. God bless me. What does that mean? It's right on the back of the t-shirt there. So when I say those two words, the North... Okay, but I didn't say it, I didn't say it, and I didn't say North America either. I said, okay, here we go. This is a GAP, God Answers Prayer, and then we've got the, um, you've heard of the Got Milk? Well, this has got Jesus, so we got that back there, and we've got the Always Jesus Christ. He's the real thing. We've got that t-shirt back there, too, and uh, am I going too fast for you? Well, that's okay, because my time is limited, and then we've got Jesus. That is my final answer. Yeah. So. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do when I say those two words, the first one standing, I might just give out a couple t-shirts. So, oh, by the way, um, I've got, my wife is a much better preacher than I am, and uh, she sells a lot more tapes than I do. This is called The Journey to the Throne. And uh, if you, if you want to learn how to take your children to, into the throne room, see, you cannot explain what you've never explored. Hello. A lot of people, I mean, I think that's probably one of the number one questions that I get as I travel around the country. How do you get your kids into the presence of God? Well, if you've never been there yourself, you'll never get your kids there. Ooh, ooh. Well, brother, you, aren't you kind of coming on kind of strong? Yeah. And I love it. I love it. Because I'm not, it's for the sake of the children. We got a bunch of children going to hell because of our stupidity and ignorance. Oh boy. <clears throat> I turn it to the throne. I won't, brother. You got to keep me going, okay? Keep me going. Thank you. You know, for years, I've never made it out of the outer courts. I'm convinced 99% of the people in our churches have never made it out of the outer courts. You know what I mean, Jelly Bean? You know the courts of praise, but they've never gone into the holiest of holies, into his presence, into the very throne room of God. I was one of those fellas in the ministry preaching. I remember times I'd come home from, from the office, from the church, ministering, and my wife would be sitting down across the table from me, and we'd be eating dinner, and she'd be sharing with me with tears coming down her face, she says, uh, you see that chair in the family room? Well, Jesus sat in that chair, and I sat on his lap for two and a half hours. And I listened, and I listened, and my heart got harder and harder. And finally I came up with the conclusion, well, this is just a woman thing. Man, you been there? Oh, you're there now. This is just a woman thing. Let her intercede. Let her pray. Let her go into the presence of God. Let her sit on daddy's lap. Let daddy God put his arms around. <laughs> you know, I got people to see and places to go and things to do. You know, I'm a busy person. I'm busy, busy, busy. Yeah, I was so stinking busy. I never had a relationship with my heavenly father. And God, my heavenly father, is saying, son, 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 I'm missing you. Son, would you come into my presence? Would you just sit on my lap? Who needs this? I said, who's desperate for this? Who? I said, who needs this? Turn to Psalm 85, verse 6, if you would, please. Psalm 85, verse 6. Are you there? Say amen. If you're not there, say glory. We will wait for the glory again. Hurry up. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Psalm 85, verse 6 says... The psalmist David, I love, I absolutely love this verse. He says, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Underline that verse, please. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Revival will always produce a rejoicing people. Revival will always produce a rejoicing people. I looked up the word revive. Wilt thou not revive? R-E-V-I-V-E. -E, revive. It means to bring back to life that which is dead or seemingly dead. 
Revive means to bring back to life that which is dead, or it seems, or it appears to be dead. A while back, a daughter brought a plant over to the house. And she said to my wife, she says, Mom, she says, I've done everything to this plant. I think it's dead. But I, I'm bringing it over here because if there's anyone that can revive this plant, it's you. So my wife took that plant in her tender, loving care. And within a week's time, I looked at that plant and I says, wow. I was seeing life. She was able to revive that plant. What is revival? Revival simply is the saints getting back to normal. Revival simply is the church functioning the way it should be functioning. Revival is the church dormant now becomes the church militant. Revival doesn't happen because you put it on a calendar. Hello. <laughs> Revival happens when you put it in your heart to seek after God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. See, we'll never be able to bring our children and our young people into a place of God and into the throne room of God if we have never been there ourselves. But see, our children are desiring to go there. And they're looking for people to take them there. Just about a month ago, we were in England with Pastor Van and uh, his team. And we were ministering at a conference in, uh, in England. And it was the last night that, that we were there. And uh, Pastor Van and his team went out to, what you, would you all go to? Sheffield? And my wife and I stayed in Birmingham because we were ministering there the next Sunday morning. And it was a Saturday night. We just got finished with the conference. And my wife and I decided to go get a scone. I mean, it's been a long time since we've had a scone. So we walked downtown to Birmingham. And we got ourselves a scone. And some, uh, she had a hot chocolate. No, I had a hot chocolate. You had decaf coffee. And after we got finished, we were walking back to the hotel room. And we noticed that in the Central Park there in Birmingham, there were thousands of people. I mean, literally thousands of people that were in the park, and we just happened to be there for what they call the prom on the park. Is that what they called it? The prom on the park? And it's similar to what we celebrate the 4th of July here in the United States. And it was televised in London, Wales, and Birmingham throughout the nation. And we were able to be witness and to be a part of that. And we, we were just, we were there and we were, we watched the Birmingham Symphony Orchestra for approximately 45 minutes. I was in awe listening to the orchestra members and I was, I was more in awe just watching the conductor. I mean, he was there in front of all his orchestra and the guy made me tired just watching them. I mean, the guy is up there. I mean, for 45 minutes nonstop. And he turns around, he looks in the cameras. He looks at the 14,000 people that were there, and he says, as you can see, we are passionate about our music. As you can see, we are passionate about our music. Boy, I got my Sunday morning message from that line. You better believe it. When he said that, I said, can the world see that we are passionate about our Jesus? Can our children really, really see that we are passionate about our Jesus? When they look at your face, do they see the glory of God? I was in a church just a couple Sundays ago. I looked at the choir's faces. I thought God had died. I'm up there, I'm up there on the platform. I'm trying, 
I'm trying. I'm looking at the choir as they're singing. I says, my God. Talk of revival. I wanted to go and just shake every one of those church members and say, are you born again? Are you saved? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? They had absolutely no life. And then we wonder why our children are the way they are. We wonder why our, our teenagers are the way they are. My wife and I went into a store, and they, they, had, they had this great big beautiful basket full of fruit. It looked beautiful. And I went up to that basket, and I touched one of the pieces of fruit. And I was disappointed. It was fake. You know why I was disappointed? Because I was expecting the real. Hello, is there anyone out there? I was disappointed because I was expecting the real thing. That's all I got was the fake. And see, our young people and our children are coming into our classrooms. They're coming into our churches. And they're looking at our faces. And my, my God, is there anyone that's alive? Is there anyone that's real in this place? They come near us and they say, oh, I thought, oh, you look like you were alive, but you're just fake. Oh, you look, oh, man. is there anybody that's alive in this place? Is there anyone that has a relationship with their heavenly father? And we wonder why our kids are the way they are. Because they're looking for some fruit. The real thing. Where you don't have to be, you don't have to have the pastor get up there and say, well, come on, will everyone lift up their hands and just praise them? Well, come on, will anyone give their tithe and offering? And, oh, let me just say this. I'm going to tell you something. If you're not a tither, don't expect your ministry to go anywhere. If you are not a giver, you will not go anywhere. You've got a purpose, and you, and by the way, you, we've got to be teaching our children now, today, and how to prosper, how to give. Because where you're going, you must be sowing. You, you sow it, God will grow it. That was just a little sideline. But see, when I, when I saw that, when, when I saw that conductor, I mean, there was so, so much enthusiasm. There was so much emotion. There was so much fervency. I couldn't help but be engulfed. I mean, I felt like going, do, 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 do. Man, by the time I got finished, man, I was exhausted. But I saw someone with emotion. I saw someone with fervency. I saw someone with passion. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about three things. Purpose, passion, and power. Purpose, passion, and power. Matthew chapter 14, would you turn there please? Matthew chapter 14. Verse 15, you know the story, Jesus was just crossed the river, he healed the multitudes. The, the Bible says there, were, there was a great multitude that followed Jesus. Now get this thinking picture out of your mind that there was just like 100, 200 people following. We're talking a great multitude. These people came from 120 miles away just to hear the master teach just to touch the hem of his garment. I mean, these people had a passion. They had a desperation. They had a hunger. You see, God will always show up when people are hungry. Are you hungry tonight? I said, are you hungry tonight? You see, we got a lot of people that are open. But you got to be more than open. You got to be hungry. And then you got to be more than hungry. You got to be desperate. See, there's a lot of, have played basketball, and you see an open fella on the court with his hands in his pocket, and he's yelling to you, hey, I'm open. Hey, I'm open. Pass 
me the ball. Hey, I'm open. Hey, dummy, I'm, I'm open. Can't you see I'm open? Would you pass him the ball? No. Because no. he's not ready. He's not expecting. He's not hungry. Yeah, he's open. But no one's going to guard him. Huh, what threat is he? Matthew chapter 14, verse 15. It says, and when it, and when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and get their own food. The disciples said to Jesus, This is a desert place. Describes many of our churches today. It describes many of our children's churches, many of our classrooms. This is a desert place. I love what the Living Bible says. It says, it's already past supper time. The people are starving. They're hungry. But there's nothing here for them to eat in this desert. This is a desert place. Does it describe your children's church? Does it describe your church? Oh, may I? Does it describe you? You see, our young people and our children, they're coming into our churches and they're hungry. You hear me now. I mean, they're coming in. They're hungry, sir. They're wanting a meal. They're wanting to be fed. They're wanting some love. But you know, we've been saying to our children the same thing that they told us when we were their age. Well, I'm sorry. We've got some coloring books here and some wonderful... We've just bought new crayons. Yeah. Yeah. We're so excited, new crayons. You don't have to use the broken ones anymore. Listen, I don't, I don't babysit children. I minister to children. Anyone here do the same thing? And it's time that we wake up. The children and the teenagers are coming into our churches. They're hungry and they're looking around because they know, they know that that's the place where they should be being fed. My, love, my wife and I, we love going out to restaurants. I mean, we love it. But there's some restaurants we do not go back to. Bad service. Hello, stay with me, spiritual. Okay, I'm using a practical illustration here. Bad service and bad food. We don't mind paying the money if we get good food and good service. But you ain't going to get us going back to a restaurant where the food was lousy and the service was lousy. And that's what we got too much of in our churches. What'd you learn, Johnny? Mom, I didn't learn anything. Hello. Nothing in, nothing comes out. That's the way it is. This is a desert place. Let them go and get their own food. And see, that's what we've been doing with our teenagers and our children for decades and for centuries. We've been saying, hey, I'm sorry, teenagers. And we've been blaming it on the world. Well, you know, it's the world that's, that's drawing our kids. No, 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 it's not the world. I'll explain in just a little bit why it's not the world. It's not the world that's snatching our kids. I mean, there's got to be a passion on the inside of us that overtakes us. When we get into the presence of a... Well, my brother, I don't want to get so emotional about this. Listen, when you love somebody, you will be emotional. I love my wife. And I'm emotional. I get emotional. I get emotional. Mm, yeah. Yeah, baby. Come on. I get emotional. Why? Because I love her. And you, if you love somebody, you will get emotional. Ladies. This is your opportunity to poke him, man. Thank you. Harder, harder. He needs it. Hey, where'd you go? <laughs> the 
this is a desert place. We got nothing to feed them. Nothing to feed them. Jesus, send them away. Let them get their own food. Let them get their own food. You see, we got a bunch of people in our churches that are a bunch of fakes. I said we got a bunch of people in our churches that are a bunch of fakes. Our young people and our children are coming to our churches and they're saying, would you please feed me? Would you give me some direction? Would you train me and teach me and mold me? Would you anoint my head with oil? Would you teach me to do the work of the ministry? And that's why we take missions trips all over the world with children. Children! We train them up how to cast devils. We, we train them how to teach the word, preach the word. We train them how to lay hands on the sick. Oh, you do that for kid? Why not? Am I teaching you some new doctrine that's not in the word? It's been there. It's been there all the time. It was even there when we were their age, when we were little kids. But you know what they did to us? The same thing we do a lot with our own kids. You're too young. And we label our kids, you're too young. No, they're not too young. They might be young, but they're not too young. They might be little, but they're not too little. Because the same spirit that lives in me lives in them. And that same anointing that's on the inside of me to cast out devils and preach the word lives in our kids too. That's all they need is someone to teach them and train them and mold them and shape them. But see, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 says, there's many people that have a form of godliness. Pastor Van, would you come up here please? And your wife. See, there's many people that have a form of godliness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. I, I brought myself some aluminum foil. I'm so proud of myself tonight because when I was a little boy, I couldn't say aluminum. I couldn't say it. I can say it now. Aluminum. Everyone say aluminum. Did you have a hard time saying aluminum when you were... Yeah, yeah. What? A, a what? Alu... Oh, that's good. This is what I need you to do. I need you to come on up here, Brother Van. Would you just step right here? And Dana, if you could um, take this piece of aluminum foil, and I want you to form it around his face. Okay? Now get it to where they... I, 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 okay? Go ahead and begin to form it. You see, there's many people in our church. Okay? And you come on, step over here a little bit so on the profile. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the eyeballs, the nostrils. Yeah, the two nostrils. Okay, take your time. Take your time. See, there's a lot of people, the Bible says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And then it lists the whole thing, and it says that many people will have a form of godliness. One translation says, a show of religion. We got too much of that in our churches. We've got a show of religion. We get people that can lift up their hands, they pray all the prayers, they sing all the songs, they put their five dollars in the offering and say, there, I'm religious, I'm a Christian. They pat themselves on the back and say, oh, look at me. You stink. It's what my Bible calls a stench in his nostrils. It's called a show of religion. We have many people that have a form of religion. The word form means shape. A pattern, appearance, look, an image, an outward resemblance. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to this world. See, what we have here is... Yeah, he looks like too much like me up here. You might want to... Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Boy, look at that nose. Ooh, good, good. Okay. Ah, yes. Ooh. Pastor Van, look. That's you, buddy. Yeah. There's so many people in our churches that have a form of godliness. They have a show of religion. This has taken on the shape, the look, the appearance, the outward resemblance of Pastor Van's face. It is just a 
form. That's absolutely worthless. Useless. Thank you. I've got some more aluminum if you want to go home and do that later, you know. <laughs> Let's give him a great big hand, everybody. <clears throat> Be not conformed, fashioned after this world. And see, that's what our young people and our children are seeing a lot of. My wife and I watched the debates last night, and one of the last questions that was asked was from a sixth grade teacher. He says, my children in my sixth grade want to know if you will keep your promises. <laughs> and see, that's what our children and our teenagers are crying out for. Is there anyone in the church that's for real? We got a bunch of fakes. We got a bunch of people that are dead, or they look dead. They need revival. They need the new wine of God's presence to be poured, but he ain't going to be pouring it into old wineskins. You know, I'm fully convinced. You know, we hear about, well, God's moving. God's moving again. Well, when God moves... I don't think it's so much God moving as it is us moving. I believe that God is waiting for his saints, for the church, to get up and get moving. Have you ever noticed that God doesn't lift up your hands? Have you ever noticed it's not God that makes you dance? Have you ever noticed it's not God that makes you smile? My Bible says, make a joyful noise. My Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. He's not going to yank you in there, sir. He's not going to yank you into the throne room and for you to sit on his lap. You're going to have to be desperate. You are, you're going to have to be hungry. See, but see, most of our people, you know how they get their hunger? Through need. Oh, God, I need you again. No, hunger should not be developed as a result of need. Hunger should be developed as a result of activity. How many of you are here are thirsty tonight, right now? You know why you're thirsty? You're probably some of those that were up here dancing, running around. Ah. Is it clicking? You're thirsty because there was some activity. And there's a difference between you just sitting here for two hours and running around the church for two hours. How many know if you were to run around the church for two hours, you would be thirsty? Why? Because of your activity. Oh, my God. You, you see, we got lights in the house. The presence, the definition of light, the definition of light is the presence of power. You might, might want to write that down. The definition, I talked myself into this, you know, through activity. The definition of light is the presence of power. Now, we all know that light travels at a speed of 186,000 miles a second. If the definition of light is the presence of power, what do you think the definition of darkness is? The absence of power. Okay, stay with me. Okay? Light. The definition is the presence of power. Darkness definition the absence of power light the presence of power moves at 186,000 miles a second at one time this evening this house was dark until someone turned down the light switch and when light came it came into this room at 186,000 miles a second the presence of power came into this room 
Now, if darkness means the absence of power, how fast did darkness leave when light came? At 186,000 miles a second. But the darkness has no power in itself. When the power, the light came in, the darkness comprehended it not. Darkness could not seize, hold down the light. Why? Darkness has no power. Let me explain it this way. Boy, it's very bright in this place tonight. Will someone turn up the darkness? Will someone turn up the darkness? Will someone turn up the darkness? Silly, huh? You can't turn up darkness unless you turn down the light. Oh, lightning brain, it's working. You can't turn up darkness, but you certainly can turn down the light. Jesus, well, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4, and God saw that the light was good. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. If any man follow me, he will not walk in darkness, but will have the, ready for this? Light of life. He will have the light power of life. He will have the power to live an abundant, overcoming life. Then he said to his disciples, and he's saying it to us tonight. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, you are the light of the world. Do you know you and I are the light of the world? A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Then he says in verse 16, he says, let your, let, there's that word let again. Let your light, so what? Shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is it. Let your light shine. It could be, just maybe, that we're seeing more darkness in the world today because could it be that the light, us, has gone dim? Oh, there's so much darkness in the world. It's getting darker and darker. You listen to the news, you read the headlines on the paper, and say, my God, it wasn't like this 30 years ago. No, it wasn't. You know why? Where are the lights? If you're only shining at 60 watts, man, that's not very bright. Huh. You know the song we used to sing when we were kids? This little light of mine. I used to sing it. God, this little light of mine, I'm, oh, come on. Little light, a lot of darkness. A lot of light, little darkness. Hey, is this making sense? Is this too deep? I'll go a little slower if it's too deep. No. Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy word giveth light. Light. The entrance of your word, O oh God, gives me light. 
Every time, do you realize every time you get into God's word and you hide it in your heart, it's producing a brighter light. As it says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, the just, the just, the righteous man's pathway gets brighter and brighter. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'm glad I started this conference off. You know why? Because we're going to see, we're going to see lights shining brighter and brighter and brighter. I know that I know I know. How did I get lipstick on that thing? Did I? Okay. No wonder some of you are looking at me kind of funny. He's got lipstick on him. <clears throat> you see what's going to happen? I know some of you have come into this place and you're... Can I stand on that chair? I know you've come into this place and some of you are ready to quit. When I'm burned out, I'm going to add fuel to the fire tonight. I said, you're not burning out. Don't you dare think about quitting. Because I'll be at your front door. We've got too many kids and too many teenagers that are going to hell. We don't need to be quitting. We don't need to let our light burn out. We need to let it shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And some of you, your, your light's only 40 watts. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it, won't let Satan. He's poofed it out a long time ago, sir. <laughs> he had no problem with you. Because you only had a little light. And you weren't letting your light shine bright. And brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And brighter. That's the way it should be, saints. Just because you don't, well, you, get, you get older doesn't mean you get dimmer. When we get older, we should be getting brighter. Don't, don't even think about quitting. Get that out of your stinking vocabulary. Well, you don't know how the pastor's treating me. He never gives me any money. You should see my room. I don't know if I'm going to be in this room one week or this room the other week. And my volunteers, oh my God, they never should. Hey, hello, no one wants to get on a sinking ship. No wonder you don't have any volunteers. I'm going to tell you something. People are always attracted to a fire. Let me add some. I said, let me add some. You want some? Come on. Take it, man. Take it, take it, take it, take it. Well, I'm just getting tired. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So get up and get moving. Let your light shine, my brother. My sister, let it shine. Let it shine bright. You know, what's going to happen tonight? We got so much light. But by tomorrow night, ooh, look out. Because this room is going to get real, real bright. And by Friday night, Brother Van, when you get up here and minister, I tell you what, there's going to be so much glory in the house. We sang about it tonight. And maybe he won't even be able to get up to minister because the glory of God. You know what the glory of God is? It's the goodness of God. It's the light of his glory. Listen to this. Oh, you like this. Look at this. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give, are you ready for this? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hello, let me go back. He's called us out of darkness and hath shined in our hearts to give light the presence
presence of power. To give us the presence of power of the knowledge of the glory of God. Do you know the glory of God should not be a mystery to us? The glory of God should not be a mystery to our teenagers and to our children. Because my Bible says he will give us knowledge of the glory of God, but it only comes, the end of that verse, in the face of Jesus Christ. You're never going to get the knowledge of the glory of God. You'll never see the glory of God unless you're in his face. I love how my wife teaches in, in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. In his presence is the fullness of joy. In the presence of fullness of joy. The Hebrew word for presence is the same word for the, the word face. It's in his face we receive the fullness of joy. Psalm 85, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us, O God? Bring us back to life that thy people may rejoice in thee. The, Ari, what does Ari mean? Do it again. Rejoice. 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 Do it again. What does it say in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So what are you going to have to do? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So what are you going to do again? Just rejoice in the Lord always. So again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord up. How do you know you're in a revival? Because you're going to be a re you're going to be a rejoicing people. You're going to be a people of purpose. You're going to be a people of passion, and you're going to be a people. Oh my God, my God, my God. of power. Our purpose, saints of God, is not one more young person or teenager or child coming into your presence again without you giving them what they need. I, I declare no more desert places. I declare no more desert places. When I got a revelation of this verse, I vowed to God. I said, God, I will never again have a child come into my meeting, my service, whether it's a conference, a missions trip, a revival service, or whatever. I'm never again going to have a child come into my service without being filled up with the presence of God. Not one child will leave my presence hungry again. Not one child will come into my presence saying, boy, that was a desert place. Never again, and you need to make the same vow tonight. Never again will you have a teenager, a boy or girl come into your church and them saying, I didn't receive anything. Bad service and bad food. I'm not coming back again. Why are, why are young, our young people not coming into our churches? Because they don't see any light. Let your light shine. Let it shine. Let it shine brighter. Let it shine brighter. So many have a form, the shape, the look. It's just a show of religion. You know what we need in our churches? We need our people to fall on their faces and repent before God. Because, because of it, we have caused many young people and many, many children to go to hell. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, it says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it would be better than a millstone be hanged around his neck and he'd be drowned in the depth of the sea. We think of that verse, oh, if, you know, whatever a person, you know, an adult does to a child that offends him. No, have you ever thought it's, Sometimes it's not only what we do to a child, it's what we don't do for the child. We don't do what God has instructed us to do, where he says, I want you to train up a child in the way that he should go. I'm fully convinced we don't need more teachers in our churches. We need fathers. Call in all fathers. Call in all fathers. What is a father? A father is someone that will reproduce after himself. Johnny, you want to know how to preach God's word? You follow me, son. 
Johnny, you want to know how to cast down devils? You follow me, son. Do as daddy does, son. Do as daddy does, son. I was in a church a couple weeks ago in Rochester, Minneapolis. Minnesota? Oh, Rochester, Minnesota. And I tell you, I saw one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. In the middle of praise and worship, there was a mommy and daddy that came down the center aisle of that church with their little two-year-old and their five-year-old. And as they were in praise and worship, mommy and daddy were right alongside son and daughter with their hands lifted up, and they were lifting up little Johnny and little, little, little child like this. And as, as mommy and daddy knelt down before God as they were singing the song, I, I could see the little two-year-old girl looking up at mommy, and she went down the same way that mommy did. And the little five-year-old boy, when daddy lifted up his hands, he lifted up his hands. When daddy began to shed a tear, there the boy was with his hands lifted up toward heaven, with tears coming down his face, looking up at daddy. I'm going to be like daddy. I'm going to be like daddy. I'm going to be like daddy. My daddy knows how to worship God. That's what our children are looking for. They're looking for some men and some women. They're looking for mothers and fathers that will say, son, I'll teach you. You come follow me. Son, daughter, you watch daddy. You watch mommy. We'll take you into the presence of God. We say, we want more of God. Well, do you know what that means? More God, less us. We say, more light, less darkness. We say, more light, more of the power, the presence of power, the presence of power when the light of his glorious gospel comes in. Something takes place. Something moves out. When light comes in, darkness cannot comprehend it. It has got to go. You'll have no desire to do what you used to do. Why? Because darkness is no longer there because you're beefing up the light. Does this make sense? Right now, you're, we got some light shining. But in just a few minutes, we're going to shine brighter. You ready? Well, how do I do that, brother? Well, the same way you stand the same way you jump, the same way you whistle, the same way, hello. See, my Bible says, where's Mark? Mark, come up here. Help me out. Mark Jr., yeah. <clears throat> my Bible says, I'm going to stand up here so I'm level with you, okay? I remember this guy who was just a little squirt. I mean, just a little squirt. Man, look at They do grow. <laughs> yeah, they do in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. That's how they grow. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. That's how he's growing. I've watched him throughout the years, growing the things of God. It's awesome. It's awesome. But see, my Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness. He's called us out of darkness, the absence of power, and brought us into the presence of power, the presence of light. Do you know who dwells on the inside of you? Touch your body. Do you know what that is? It's called the temple. Don't you know that your body is the temple? It's the house of the Holy Ghost that he dwells in you and he wants to do something to you and through you and out of you. It's called... now. Mark, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, 
that we should show forth that we should show forth the praises, 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 that we should show forth the praises. Can you jump? Show me. Show me. That we should show forth the praises, that we should show forth the praises, that we should show forth the praises. Can you run? Show me. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, help him, help him. <laughs> Can you whistle? Show me. Mark, can you spin around? Show me. Just one more, just in case there's someone here that's not getting this. Mark, can you reach down and touch your toes? Show me. All right, I think everyone in the house got the revelation. That we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Mark, can you praise the Lord? Show me. Show me. Show me. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. If I had a piece of candy, I'd give it to you. <laughs> Listen, saints. Chris, where are you? Up? Are you someone up with Chris and your, your, your band or whatever? Can they come up and help me? Good. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because what we're going to do tonight, put your Bibles down, put your notebooks down. This is called message practice. I believe... Whenever I preach, there should be a demonstration. There should be a manifestation of what you just learned. So what we're going to do, come on out, guys. Chris, we're going to have some, we're going to have some, um, two things, a song of passion, okay? And then we're going to have a song of power. One of those power songs. Okay? But before we do that, I want a passion song. He's thinking. What are you all standing for? I know what you're waiting to do. They're waiting to show forth his praises. Yeah! Yeah, dig it in, dog, man! Yeah! You're ready to let your light shine! So everyone can see that it's shining brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter! I'm gonna tell you something. Ladies and gentlemen, as the light shines brighter in your life, when light comes in, at 186,000 miles a second into a room where there might be 25 children, where there might be 50 children, where there might be 200 children, and those children have hurts and problems, and deep down in the inside they're crying out for someone to help them. But well, see, you've got the light, the presence of power. And when light comes into a room that's filled with darkness, darkness cannot comprehend it. Why? Because it doesn't have any power in and of itself. 
Light comes in, darkness goes. The anointing comes in. <laughs> the anointing comes in. The anointing comes in. And the praises go up. Saints of God, don't you dare leave this place. Don't you dare leave this place. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something. Can I have that handheld? You got a handheld? I'm going to have the handheld so I can hear myself a little bit better. Yeah, go ahead. Listen, I used to preach. Well, if there's just one person at this conference that their life is turned around for God, it was worth it all. I say, humbug on that. Listen, it sounds religious, and that's all it is. It's religious trash, because you won't find that in my Bible. Oh, if there's only one person, it makes all the difference. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus did. He was out to get them all. And I'm out to get every single one of you in this place. You didn't come here to get a little pat on the back and saying, keep up the good work. No. Ladies and gentlemen, by the Spirit of the living God, we have come into this place because we are about ready to go to a new dimension in the Spirit with our children. Because with every passing season, there are different smells. There are different smells for every different season. Do you smell something different in the air? I said, do you smell something different in the air? Something's taking place. Because we're about ready, saints of God, to move into a new season of our life where the light gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and the darkness can no longer stay. It can't. Lift up your hands, everybody. Show forth his praises. Show forth his praises. Who's called you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. Show forth his praises. and brought us into his marvelous light. Let's praise him, folks. Go ahead, Chris, take it away. Oh, come on, let's worship God. Let's 